I'd like to invite um, our panelists on the MOU to come up. I'll be asking Mr. Clayton Kootney, who's the team lead for the MOU, uh, Candice Willier from Treaty 8, and um, Amelia Ferrosden from Aboriginal and Northern Affairs Canada to come up and give you some information, perhaps an update on the MOU. And the MOU is um, up on the board on the projection screen, Memorandum of Understanding for First Nations Education in Alberta. So after we're done this panel, we'll be moving into the afternoon sessions. So without further ado, Clayton, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, my name is Clayton Kudney, and uh, I just live over there. I'm from uh, Alexander First Nation. I'd like to welcome you to uh, Treaty 6 Territory. And uh, I'd like to thank the Chief for the uh, song. I know he's not here, Chief Antoine, for the song this morning. A very uh, heartfelt song. And I'd also like to thank the elders that raised the pipes, the pipe yesterday, for honoring uh, your people here today. And uh, it's an honor, like I said, to be here and uh, to do this work on your behalf. I work for Treaty 678. I work for Treaty 6, 7, and 8. And I'm, uh, I've been working on this file for a number of years. And uh, it, it, it found me. I didn't find it. And the way I was approached uh, was to come and help help out. Uh, they were looking for some help. And for me, that's, that's the way, right way to do it. And I'd like to thank uh, the Grand Chief for bringing all of us together today. And uh, for the technicians, for Dale Wasis and his guidance. Uh, Kyle Lamont, who always sits in the background, but, you know, uh, for cobbling together all the monies. To bring you all together here because that was a great undertaking and they deserve a round of applause for that. And also, uh, Candice Villier, who uh, phoned everybody and emailed everybody and still is emailing everybody, uh, and her great work. Uh, she came on this file uh, with us as a student, as a summer student, and uh, we groomed her uh, into who she is today now. And sometimes it's chaotic. Uh, this file has gone up and down. Uh, over the last five years. Uh, but you know, uh, over the last five years, I've, I've learned a lot as well uh, about our people, about being patient, about how things, like Dr. Littlebear said, are always in flux. It's not always linear. We're always looking at a linear movement. But actually, for Nihil, for our people, it's always been like that. Even with the agenda, you know, we were supposed to be on yesterday, but that, that never happens that way, especially with the eh? Right? So you gotta be flexible. You gotta be, you know, open-hearted to look at ways of working together. And that's what the MOU has done. Remember, I'm of understanding is a vehicle for a way forward for our people. And that's the way I look at it. It's a tool. It's a complementary tool that assists our children to take the rightful place in our society. That's how I see the MOU. We've, we've struggled along the way. We've had our challenges. Uh, but you know what? I'm still here. And, and, and why I'm still here is because I, I care about uh, doing something. Uh, I don't want to continue to be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. And what you guys are doing here today by gathering by talking to one another, and what you're going to do in the next couple of days by sharing your experiences, being honest with one another about how you'd like to move forward. That's what we'd like to see. Some of the dollars that uh, the EPP, where the MOU has been funded, the Education Partnership, has helped brought, brought you guys together as well. So to use some of our monies, which is great, because that's, this is exactly what those dollars are for. And I'm honored to have uh, my colleague here, Amelia Rosen, sit beside me today. And unfortunately, the province is quite busy. They'll be here too as well. They're one of the partners with the MOU. And uh, so 
I'm going to pass the mic over to Amelia. She's going to talk a little bit about some of the background. Because some people might have not heard about the Memorandum of Understanding for First Nation Education. So she's going to give you a little bit of the background. I'm going to talk about some of the uh, the uh, areas that we, we, we kind of addressed along the way in a long-term strategic plan. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of, about the uh, Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom Center. And then, uh, then I guess you guys will be in your breakout sessions. So uh, I'll hand over to Mike to Amelia and she can continue with the presentation. Thank you very much. I'll make a funny noise if I clap and hold the mic at the same time. Thank you so much, Clayton. Uh, thank you to the Grand Chief, Chiefs, Elders. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and um, I'm happy to share some information here. We look forward to answering questions and hearing more from everyone that's here in the room. So the Memorandum of, Memorandum of Understanding for First Nation Education in Alberta was signed in February 2010, where Treaty Number 6, Number 7, and Number 8, the Government of Alberta and Canada signed the Memorandum of Understanding um, at Satina, I think it was. The shared vision of the MOU, First Nation students are to achieve or exceed the full educational outcomes, levels, and successes of all other students in Alberta. The MOU elected officials met on September 24th in 2013 to review the draft long-term strategic action plan that was developed under the MOU. All parties agreed to move forward on work to implement the plan and uh, here we are, 2016, January, and uh, we have recently had a meeting on December 16th of our senior officials, and it was a very positive meeting. Um, all attendees were there, and one of the many outcomes of that meeting was to conduct a five-year review of the MOU to see where we are, what are our lessons learned, what are the pros and cons, what's working, what's not. And so we're looking forward to um, looking at what's been accomplished, what's been done, and how can we move forward together with this MOU in hand. So this page talks about the proposed restructured First Nation education system in Alberta. <coughs> The MOU Working Group is proposing to restructure the First Nations education system in Alberta through a joint action plan that will formalize all parties' roles and responsibilities, maximize the impact of investments, and create new ways of supporting First Nation education to improve student outcomes. Under the proposed restructured First Nation education system, the First Nations child will have greater access to learning opportunities for improved outcomes and fluency in their own language through enhanced language and culture instruction and culturally appropriate curriculum and resources. The child will have comparable access to supports and services currently available to children who reside off reserve, including greater access to early learning programs and wraparound supports. I'm just going to go off. Off, off uh, script here for a second and just remind everyone that the MOU working group, the work that we do, we are constantly reminding ourselves that in this diagram at the center is the child. And I think that's what keeps everyone's feet to the ground and motivated to keep moving forward and making things happen in the best way that we can. Okay, I'll go back on script now. <laughs> The First Nation School will also be better supported to improve student outcomes and strengthen cultural identity in a First Nations education system. Parents and communities will support all aspects of the First Nations education system, including the establishment of parent and community councils, which will provide a link or voice from the community to the First Nation education authority. All First Nation education authorities will be supported by the Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom Center. Treaty 6, 7, and 8 will present on the role of the IKWC next, but of course, uh, Clayton is going to be representing uh, 6, 7, and 8 for us today. The next page talks about, actually the next few pages are going to be talking about the roles uh, 
in this restructured system for each of the parties. So this first page talks about the role of Canada in Canada First Nations and Alberta will support the restructured system and in this restructured system Canada will make annual funding available for initial core operations and make annual funding available for individual initiatives undertaken by the centre. Just a note to date, the financial support from Canada to date has been provided through what's called the Education Partnerships Program. Um, the other role Canada is taking on is to provide stable and predictable funding for First Nations elementary secondary education and to support First Nation education authorities to enter into collaborative frameworks with provincial school boards. So this page talks about the First Nations role in a restructured system. So in the restructured education system, First Nations will govern and operate the Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom Centre, and govern and operate First Nations education authorities, including parent and community councils. First Nations will also receive and administer funding through the IKWC and potentially education authorities and federal and provincial initiatives funding through the IKWC and education authorities. And this third page talks about uh, what Al the government of Alberta would do. Uh, so in this restructured education system, Alberta will provide support and expertise to the Indigenous Knowledge and Wisdom Center in order to build capacity in data collection and management, accountability and reporting, system improvement, and curriculum and resource development, as examples. Um, extending identified provincial initiatives to First Nation education authorities uh, and organizations. Uh, supporting provincial school boards to enter into collaborative frameworks with First Nation education authorities and organizations. And I'm going to hand this back to Clayton to continue the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. So we spent a lot of time talking with a lot of community members. Some of you were actually a part of, and Harry Lawrence actually sits uh, on our uh, working group and helps direct us uh, as one of our elders. Um, there was a number of people that participated in our, in our sub table work. And from our subtitle work, we uh, accumulated about 111 recommendations. In those recommendations, we had to kind of look at a joint action plan, a long-term strategic action plan, which we created. And we're in, in the process of implementation of the long-term strategic action plan. But in, in between in the last year or so, um, there's been a couple of elections. I, I like not to think that elections affect, but elections both at, at the band level affect uh, things uh, being done also at the provincial and their federal level. So there was a provincial election in the last year or so and also a federal election, which actually um, impeded some of our ability to do some of the work, but we're kind of starting to gain some, some momentum again. Uh, the funding, there was lulls in our funding uh, through the year, but we kind of managed to, to make it through because of the support, mostly from the regional uh, federal government, from INAC. Uh, they did find monies to continue with some of the supports, but unfortunately we didn't have enough monies uh, uh, last year to get the IKWC up and going. But we did manage to do a couple of things, and in our joint action plan, one of the main, main things was to establish the IKWC. The, the joint action plan is considered to be a living document in initial priority areas. Each action item is in its own project and may further develop and refine all parties will implement. So we all agreed to, to this joint action plan. The foundational uh, pieces of the restructured First Nation education system in Alberta are the establishment of IKWC. The IKWC is scheduled to be in operations and is ongoing. Going forward, the IKWC is expected to play an essential role in engaging Canada and Alberta on further actions implemented under the MOU. Number two, the development of an opt-in framework mechanism for First Nations education. 
Uh, Canada, Alberta, and First Nations develop a framework mechanism to work uh, to which First Nations uh, education authorities look at possibly looking at an opt-in situation. The framework mechanism is set up under, uh, understanding related to the parties to the framework mechanism responsibilities, uh, respecting the program and services and funding, governance, accountability, and reporting relationships, and the process for which review and amendments. So in that area, we look at possible looking at a mechanism for an opt-in framework. The establishment of First Nations education authorities, including parent and community councils, we could also look at assisting in the development of that as well. Development of standards for education service agreements, uh, we were looking at that as well, and I know that the province is doing some work in this area, which we need to have some conversations about. And the development of the collaborative framework between First Nations education authorities and school boards is another area that we're looking at in the joint action plan. Uh, yet another area was we, we looked at is the establishment working group to develop an action plan for further pro uh, progress in committing areas for consideration and subtable recommendations. Because we couldn't implement all 111 recommendations, we looked at some of the low hanging fruit in the joint action plan. And these are some of the areas that we looked at. But we didn't want to forget about those recommendations that came from the subtables. So we, we're still looking at a, a possibly a review. We're doing a review on the work that the, the MOU has done to date. Uh, we're in the process of, of, of doing that. We have a meeting coming up uh, next month, and we're going to be talking about reviewing uh, some of the work the MOU has completed to date. And in that, we look at some of the recommendations that haven't been uh, implemented uh, so far. Development performance indicators and complete annual reporting to the monitoring progress. We were looking at IKWC working with Canada and Alberta to develop like indicators and reporting. So we looked at different indicators of success in this way. Ongoing analysis and comparison of federal and provincial K to 12 funding methodologies. We did a couple of reports on comparative analysis, uh, two different uh, takes on it. And we wanted to continue to look at reviewing uh, the funding and looking at the different possible uh, deficiencies in the funding mechanisms. The development of the mechanism to ensure stable and predictable funding for First Nations elementary and secondary education, and the extension of selected provincial initiatives for First Nations education authorities, which, which is basically looking at a collaborative uh, funding framework when you look at working with uh, local uh, provincial uh, school boards. The last uh, item that we want to kind of bring up and I kind of alluded to a bit on is the IKWC establishment. Uh, we're in, we're in, actually have a meeting this Friday with, with the partners. Uh, we're looking at submitting another proposal for this coming fiscal year to look at uh, hopefully the implementation of uh, IKWC. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, we didn't really have a lot of uh, monies to look at implementation last year because of the different uh, elections that were going on and really affected our abilities to go forward on a forward basis. But we are moving forward. We do have a, a couple of spaces that have been identified. So actually, actual buildings uh, here in the city of Edmonton that the uh, Edmonton Public Schools uh, are going to give, uh, give to us through the uh, Alberta Education uh, rent free. Uh, one of them is a Queen Mary Park School uh, that we looked at. The north, the north side of that school is available for us. And the other one is uh, the Donald Ross School, uh, which is located uh, kind of like uh, by the ballpark in, in the River Valley. So that, that school is also made available to us at this point in time. So we're looking at actually having a site uh, for, and there was another school in, uh, in Calgary that we looked at, uh, John, John Walker School. And uh, that was also uh, made available to us as well. So there's a couple of, uh, Partners, uh, partnership uh, uh, things that, that they want to look at, and one of them was the, is from the province is to actually give us a place to actually hang our hat, so this is looking at office space. So um, that's kind of where we're at with, with uh, everything on the MOU, um, and I, I would open it up uh, to any questions that anybody might have, or I'm not sure if anybody has any questions for us at this point. Is 
That's it. Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to ask, direct my question to Amelia. Um, my grandson attends early entry program in, at Dr. Clark's school. Um, and so does another grandson who's attending another, he's attending early entry as well. My question to you is, why is it that uh, Northland School Division is not offering early entry? Uh, the community in Fort Chippewyan, for example, that little children are not being offered early entry programming. And I think that's a very important time for them to start learning about their language, their culture, their customs, and be ready and prepared when they enter the kindergarten. That's an excellent question, Rita. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the answer as to why Northland School Division doesn't offer the early entry program. Um, but I think it's something worth pursuing because I've heard over and over again the importance of early childhood education and the earlier the better. So um, I'm happy to facilitate a dialogue with uh, folks at Northlands and yourself to talk about the importance to seek opportunities um, and to build on some of the collaborative partnership work that the province is doing. So I've made a note of it here. Thank you. Chief Noski. I'm going to ask a written question here. And is this uh, like where we are today in the process of the MOU? And you're talking about restructuring and stuff. Is that basically as I seem to remember your words, is this just a process of moving furniture around or is it actually new funding and you know, new directives kind of thing? Within the, the three governments involvement, right, with the MOU. Uh, that was one. And the other question I had was as far as the First Nations Education Authority, you know, like I, I see it on the slide there that uh, it's going to be channeled from First Nations to these education authorities. I guess what kind of uh, consultation has been happening with the, say, uh, land operated schools about, you know, you buying for this thing that's the outcome of it. Uh, and the third one was with the changes, like you said, in the federal and the provincial government, do you see that that change enhance this process of the MOU or make us sit somewhere for a better or status quo going forward? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief. Um, the, the funding, uh, for me, the uh, EPP is under new envelope. Unfortunately, it's not statutory funding uh, for any kind of enhancements. We're kind of at the uh, beck and call of uh, memorandums to cabinet, which I think is, is a disservice to our people. I think we need to look at, at some point when we're ready, statutory long-term funding. Uh, but for now, what we do have is, uh, is kind of policy-based funding. And um, it's over and above the dollars that we get. Underneath the education partnership uh, proposal, it's underneath uh, an envelope uh, of, uh, I'm not sure what, what it is, $200 million now for investment for the next five years, but we have a new government in play. So they haven't put forth their budget uh, fully yet. So there is a new investment, uh, not only just in some of the work that we're doing, but also in infrastructure, new schools and such, $500 million for new schools and infrastructure is still in play. But we don't have any control over that, not at the MOU level. That's way beyond my pay grade. Um, the, on, on the First Nation Education Authority piece, because it was such a contentious issue with the legislation, we kind of took our foot off the gas on that one. And I know that uh, there's different uh, regions that are looking at creating education authorities. And, uh, and I know that there's a number of uh, Muscatese and also your tribal council is looking at uh, a collaborative framework agreement with the province. So those things are kind of uh, 
I would say peripheral things that we kind of influence. I wouldn't say that we are right at the table negotiating. And I think that's kind of how the MOU is all. We're not telling people what to do. We're trying to assist people through, way through all this. Because it's a lot. It's a lot of things to think about when you're creating a system. One of the things that we really, the cornerstone of our work is that establishment of the knowledge center. Uh, you can look at it as a second level or third level service delivery, but we haven't really defined it that way. All I see is that my daughters that go to school at home haven't been affected by any of the work that I've done to date. And for me, that's problematic. I want to see some tangible outcomes to some of the work we're doing. So my daughters can benefit from it. Right now, like what you guys said earlier, we've been talking about it. I too am tired of talking about it. I want to see something done. So one of the things we've kind of really pushed all our chips in on, on is on the Knowledge Center establishment. That's one of the cornerstones to look at cultural revitalization and language. The Dene language, the Cree language, the Kota Sioux language, all the different ling linguistic groups in Alberta. To look at supporting those, because those were taken from us, the residential schools. And our children deserve those. My daughter deserves to learn Cree if she has that ability to learn Cree at her school. Although as a parent, it's still my responsibility. Uh, as far as the new government, um, I was fortunate enough to attend uh, the AFN Special Assembly in, in, uh, just before the Christmas break. And uh, Prime Minister, historically the first time in history a Prime Minister came to the Assembly. No Prime Minister has ever addressed the Chiefs in, at, at, at that level, nor with the Native Brotherhood when there's an era of Brotherhood, and now with the Assembly of First Nations. It was very historic and I was honored to be there, to hear him talk to our leadership, the passion that he has that he wants to work with our people. I was fortunate enough later on that, that uh, on, on Wednesday, we had a meeting with Minister Bennett, and she showed the same compassion and interest and genuinity to, uh, to help work with us. So I believe that this government, the federal government, uh, is turning a, a, a corner, and I think there's more, there's gonna be more uh, possibility of partnering and working with, with, with this government. Um, as far as the provincial government, I was fortunate enough to be in a room to meet with Minister Egan, and we had a really good conversation. And I think there is a willingness uh, for the provincial government to work with us as well. But I think on our part, we have to kind of articulate these things to them. What do we want to do as First Nations people? What do you guys want to do? I think that's what you're going to be discussing in the next couple of days. So the opportunity is unprecedented for our people to work with these governments. And I think we should take, take that opportunity and do something great, something for our children. And I think you guys, I know you guys are heading in the right direction here at Treaty 8. And it's very uh, nice to see everybody here and all the work that you're doing. So definitely um, take this opportunity that has never been bestowed upon our people before with this government and uh, run with it. And let's see where we can go for our children. But thank you very much for uh, allowing us to you know, spend some of your time here today. Uh, Chief Rose can't ask any more questions. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I think there's another question out there. Thank you very much, Chief Nosky. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rose Lovacan. I'm not Chief Rose. <clears throat> but I'm um, I remember way back when in Canmore when this whole thing started and First Nations, Indian Affairs, and the province with the MOU. I see that on your slides, the province is still not putting any kind of funding towards this process. It's all in, in kind. We pay tuition to the province. We are the only people who pay for our, our education in the public system. They in turn should turn that over back to the IKWC for further research and accommodation of putting 
the knowledge back into the center. That's just a recommendation because we know that the funding is going to be our biggest issue when it comes to the knowledge center. And this is not a new idea, this is an old idea. In the red paper in 1969, when the red paper came out, the elders wanted a knowledge center. And we need to do that so we have a place to store our data. Because at the rate that we're going with the, the loss of our language and our culture, and what Dr. Leroy Luther was talking about this morning, the Indian way, the knowledge, the, you know, of thinking. We need something that's going to be stored in and kept as data for the future of our children. I also want to know the location of the IKWC. I know when I was the portfolio chief, I fought for the IKWC to be central, to be in Edmonton, or are we going to have three centers? The problem we have, we're having is the lack of cohesiveness of the three areas and getting that work done. And if we're moving ahead on our own and from Treaty 8, we need to. This was a commitment by the federal government, the IKWC. If you look at the MOU, it was a commitment by them. And so the funding should fall into place for it. And hopefully that we will continue to be able to get those doors open and so that we move forward. But at no point in time, with the intentions of the chiefs of the day at that time, for the MOU, where we in wanting to interfere with the autonomy of the nations themselves and their processes. I think you need to know that, and I don't think that's going to change. But it's just that knowledge has to be kept. We don't write stuff, us guys, we just kind of remember it. And it's wonderful that the elders are still remembering it, but at some point, I don't know what a lot of the elders know, and we need to start recording and getting that information in a place where we can utilize it for the future. I'm hoping that the IKWC is one of the things that, that's concrete that's going to come out of the MOU, and that everybody will be able to utilize it across Treaty 8 and the province and anybody else wants to learn about the First Nation people in our area. I think it's going to be of great importance once it gets done. But I need to know where the actual structure is going to be. Thank you. I can't really answer that question. Um, we're still in, 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 um, in a debate but, uh, of where the location is going to be. It might be centralized, but it, eventually it's not going to matter where its where location is because it will be more it will be more a virtual resource center uh, anyway. But but I, I agree. I, I can't answer that question. Sorry, uh, Rose Rose Lubakan. You put me on the spot, but uh, you know it, it's kind of a contentious issue. She's right. Uh, it's more on our end that we have to kind of. Three, six, seven, and eight. Um, I wouldn't say um, it, it's the federal government's. Uh, it's too easy to point the finger at that. It's more on our end. We have to learn to get along. Uh, we have to learn to put our differences aside and think about the children, not just talk about it. So I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that we can come up with uh, a resolution where we can all live with having a, a centralized location for the, the knowledge center. Good afternoon. My name is Marie Adam. I, we've been talking about education the last couple of days. And uh, I'd just like to ask you a question. Just what kind of a guarantee 
can you give the future students, the children that are coming, that their education will be paid for? Because today, <clears throat> many of our uh, students, young people, drop out. There's lots and lots of dropouts. And then when they want to go back to school, and they're told, well, there's no funding for to get back to school. So then eventually they lose two, two years, sometimes three years, before they're able to get into any kind of program. And in that three-year gap, gap, I mean, they're losing a lot of time. They're losing a lot of things that they can do, accomplish. And, and I'm speaking for all our young generation, our young children. And, and nobody has mentioned anything about the children, like the dropouts as well as the suicide in our, in the communities. Why is that happening? There's something missing, something is not being done. I mean, what kind of system does the schools have that these children come to take their own lives? I can't just say I'm blaming the school, but that's where the children are up there from 8 in the morning till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, five days a week. So this is where a lot of things are picked up, a lot of bullying, and it, it's, uh, it's scary. It is scary because I have a lot of great-grandchildren. I have my grandchildren and also great-grandchildren. Not only me, but I'm sure a lot of us here. So it, it, there has to be something done. I mean, but where do you start? How do you start? How do we start? Who do we talk to? And then when it comes to funding, I mean, this is our treaty rights of funding for the children. That's their rights. You can't take that away from them. Their education and their, and their uh, medica medical health, health. These two things are very important in the young generation to come. And so that worries me a lot when I look at my great grandchildren and other kids as well. So this is the question now. Putting to you. Our Thank you, Marie. Um, I, I just want to speak to uh, two things. Uh, one is that we do have um, a lot of organizations and First Nations that are working on, um, I'm going to use the term outreach schools to capture those students that you just described who have left school um, for whatever reason and then they wish to return to finish their schooling to get their certificate or diploma to continue on and they've missed those key years um, and then they're no longer eligible to attend the band operating school because they may be above the age. And so what some First Nations have been doing, and it's an excellent idea, it's an excellent approach, where they've opened up these outreach programs to assist and support these students so that they can complete their education. And um, I would be happy to talk to you more about it offline uh, if, because it would take a little bit more time, but I know that um, that come, that's, a, that's generated by First Nation groups and organizations, administrators, educators that have come together to answer that problem. And I think that you would be happy to know that there are several of them in Alberta. And so I think there's something to be said uh, in terms of the department meeting that need because we, we have criteria that are in place now, but I think we need to start expanding it and, and thinking about those students and what we can do to complete education. And then the other um, item I just wanted to share before I pass along, because I'm sure Clayton may, might have something more to say as well to help answer your question, 
But um, just this morning I was reading, and you probably are already aware of this, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, I, I read an alarming statistic today about First Nations. And uh, the number was one in five. And it was one in five First Nations that have attempted suicide. One in five. And it's alarming. So um, I just, I recognize what you're saying. Uh, I obviously don't have the answers, but I do look forward to continuing and working with um, First Nation organizations, administrators, educators on trying to find solutions. And, and I, I wish I could fast forward this meeting <laughs> a couple of months down the road where we're in a place where our federal budget was announced and we do have some answers in terms of funding and potential increases. We know, we've all seen the mandate letter, we know something's coming down the pike. I just don't know what it is yet. But I assure you, I share this information with headquarters. I write questions down. I continue to move that information as much as I can. I guess this is a random elder uh, Adam. I remember you from Fort McMurray. I went to school with a couple of your granddaughters, I believe, uh, Cooney and uh, Tracy. And uh, those I was actually raised in Treaty 8 territory, if you want to know, in uh, Fort McMurray. Uh, my dad worked up there for a number of years, and I have no regrets. I had a lot of fun uh, uh, living up there and, and growing up in Fort McMurray. Um, but the work that you're doing today, uh, it's right in front of you. I think you continue to create a system uh, of support because the status quo doesn't work. Obviously, you see that right now, you're witnessing that today. Uh, so a way forward, I think, is in front of you. Putting your minds together, coming up, up with some solutions. I think you're, you're on your way uh, to solving some of these issues that are plaguing our communities and suicides and hopelessness. So I, I know you guys have come up with some of the solutions, so you are on the right track. And we'll continue to support you to do that. And there's no guarantees. Nobody ever has any guarantees, unfortunately. Uh, but I can only guarantee I'm gonna do the best I can to help out. That's all I can do for you, uh, you know, at this point, Elder Adam. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Clara Mercer. I'm from Fort Mackay First Nation. I have something to tell you. And I, this town I'm gonna to tell you about falls under Treaty 8 territory. But what I have to tell you is about Northland School. And I don't know if you can help, I don't think so. I think this is where the Minister of Education of our province has to come in. But anyway, what happened before Christmas was I have a grandson going to the school in grade seven. And he was taking history. And he had to do homework and he brought his work home. And what he had to do in that history was write an paragraph. And he cried. He didn't want to do that particular paragraph. It made him cry and made him, made him very, very sad. He was very upset. In that particular history book, what he had to do was talk about the native people. And in, in that particular works he had to do, we were called savages. And he did. He came home crying, told, telling his mom and dad, I'm not doing that. I am not a savage. I'm native. And I'm proud to be an Indian. Anyway, my grandchildren are taught to be proud of who they are. No, they have never been ashamed of being an Indian. But this is what's happening in Northland School. I think maybe the chiefs being aware because it, it falls under the Treaty 8. It all falls all across Alberta. They're teaching the history and calling the native children savages. 
And what do you think that will do with a child in school when they go out for recess and all the other kids are calling them savages? Of course there's going to be some kind of uh, fighting going on. So what the schools are doing is just making the kids fight. What happened then was my son took that to the principal in school and he found out that the teachers that come to teach there are very, they have different nationality. They don't know the first thing about us native people. They do not pay no training whatsoever to try and understand native children. And I know in that particular school, if native if the little children are acting up, they throw them aside to uh, what they call them special ed education children. But this is um, this history is being taught right across Alberta under Treaty 8. And when my son went to Northland School in that in that particular town, and um, he was told that there's nothing that he in the Northland School Division can do. It would have to come from the Minister of Education of Alberta. And he tried, and he tried to arrange for a meeting with education of the Minister of Education. And, uh, and the Minister of Education of Alberta refused to meet with him. So he, t he couldn't take it any further. But I think if the chiefs in the Treaty 8 area is aware of what your children are being taught, at least maybe they can check into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. You know, uh, we, we still face a lot of racism in our communities, a lot of uh, violence towards our people, and this, this type of stuff shouldn't go on on notice. Shouldn't, uh, we should take it to the forefront, and that's one of the things we'll, uh, we'll take note of and uh, make sure that the minister hears about it, and uh, and we're going to encourage him to visit uh, Fort Mackay School, talk to the. It's not Fort Mackay School, it's another school in Fort McMurray. Left the fish, okay? So, uh, so we'll get the information from you and, and you know, make sure that we uh, notify the Minister of Education, Mr. Egan, to, uh, to look into it and see what, uh, what, uh, what, are, what are the challenges uh, facing our First Nations uh, students at the school today. There's so much of that going on in, in, in all our communities. You know, the elder spoke about uh, suicide, and I think that's one of the, the main topics in our in, in all our tables in terms of how we deal with that and and what can we do. You know, the first thing we can do as people is that everything starts at home. We teach our children about respect, respect to one another. But at the same time, you know, uh, the dark side of history. Whether you're directly or indirectly impacted, you know, the residential school issue, the stories have to be told. Our, our children, our grandchildren need to understand what happened, what happened to us, whether we're directly involved or indirectly involved. And that's something that's affecting our, our children today, the lateral violence. It's affecting our people in our communities, in, at the workplace. You know, just getting a, a, a text message uh, from one of my employees back home saying, feeling very uh, insecure because I think that's being bullied. And that's something that, you know, it, it shouldn't happen as they need. As people, we should be able to realize what we need to do to help our children. And I think this is where the discussion of this, uh, the moment, an important discussion around education is what we do at home, how we teach our children. 
How will we bring back laughter into our communities? You know, the only time we come together to come out of our trenches is when we're burying someone. When is the time now we're going to come, uh, stay out of our trenches and start opening our hands and acknowledging one another and be able to laugh together? You know, there's so much violence in our communities. It, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. And one of the can make a change is us as people. You know, one of, one of the recommendations I made to the Athabasca Tribal Council is that uh, we start uh, the, the language, the Cree language, the teachings of the Cree and Dene language in our communities. I start doing the Cree challenge, do the Dene challenge. We, ha we, have, we have the technology, video conferencing technology that we can uh, connect the communities together. Right now we're on live stream, we're, we're being broadcast all over the world. It's so easy to do that. We can, we can teach our people, our children, about the right way. The extended family concept has to be back in our communities. It's not there no more. We, have, we need to support our teachers. Our teachers are not our uh, uh, part, their responsibility to raise our kids. It's their responsibility as parents to teach our kids. But they're there to protect our kids. And if that happens, then something has to be done. And we will look into that for you uh, there. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, so there's a couple more. Uh, we'll take a couple more. Uh, we're kind of falling behind here. Uh, you know, the MOU uh, presentation, the people are still going to be around. So we need to, to uh, take time to chat with them. Need to do that. But we'll take a couple more. Three more. Okay. Thank uh, you. Dr. Rita Martin. Thank you. Um, this is a recommendation to the MOU. Um, Rose talked about uh, um, having stories, interviewing elders um, to keep the history in the um, Indigenous Knowledge Center. One thing that I want to you know, re uh, bring to your attention is that we have to ensure that all the communities have access to modern equipment, for example, um, uh, distance learning. You know, how is how is uh, how is my brother living at Fort Chippewyan right now at home? How can we have access to his stories? Because he is uh, an elder, lived off the land, trapped all his life. Um, he can, he's got valuable, valuable stories, but in order to keep that, we need a very good equipment for um, for the at the IOKW Center, and at the same time to be able to reach all those 24 communities within the Gate area. Anyway, for Chippewa I just wanted to acknowledge the Fort Chippewa ADCS students. Hello. Um, just to let you know that uh, continue learning your language, your heritage. Um, keep trying, one of these days you will be, you'll retain your language. Excellent.
That's what comes to kids are all drawing me up. And, uh, that's where the problem is. I wrote a, one of my knees hanging himself last summer. He surely hurt everybody's feelings. And then I wrote a letter here about a month ago. I wrote a letter to all the chiefs and all the leaderships and organization people. I never got to respond yet. And uh, I'd like to see the chiefs, all the chiefs and leadership. I hope they, uh, they respond to me here pretty soon. Uh, because uh, it's, it's not right the way things go right now, but on account of alcohol and, and uh, drugs, community hall, I mean, that's all over the uh, community. The people's having problems with that. That's where the problem is. That's all I want. Thank you, Elder. We have a lady. Thank you, Grand Chief Steve Coutre. I'd just like to uh, go back to the MOU, Clayton. I sat at the sub table in one of the groups and uh, we did a lot of what we heard and what we wanted to see changed. Um, since that time, um, there's been funding in place to hire staff and to move forward with some of the developments of the MOU. I want to ask one question. When was the last newsletter that was put out with the MOU? Do you recall that? The newsletter that we, last year? Okay. Um, since last year, we had a newsletter, and it kind of gave us an update, right, Clayton, on what was happening. Since that time, um, we are now in 2016, and I imagine there's been funding in place to do some activities and some deliverables within from 2015 to 2016. And I guess the question is, what are the most recent developments? And you said earlier that there really you couldn't really give us an answer to that. Um, I'm sure there are action items, and I understand there's struggles with it internally. And um, so, where do we go from there? Who supports you to come back to our table and talk about some of those struggles? Like, is there a process in place to see how we can address some of those struggles, or is it just at the senior level and then just kind of you try to, you know, work it out somehow? The other thing is, I see you have a presentation here. We'd love to have a copy of that. That's part of a deliverable and it'd be nice if you can have it for us tomorrow. But I'd really like to see an update because it just seems like we're in a standstill and nothing is happening, but there's money in place for staff, but we don't see it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, it would seem kind of uh, discombobulated. You know, that's a $2 word. Um, it's been kind of sporadic, right? Uh, the first two quarters of last year, uh, was mainly uh, skeletal staff or continued myself and the uh, officers, so Candice and representatives from Tree 7 and 6 were continued on. Um, that was that happened for the first two quarters. We had uh, CAs for that. Fortunately enough, we did secure some money in the last six months, uh, starting September 1st, to look at some softer types of initiatives. Uh, one of them, what you guys are working on, is uh, is your standard development. So there were some monies given to Treaty 8, uh, Treaty 6, and Treaty 7 to look at standards. Each of the treaty areas has a different way of doing this, and they have been uh, taking on different aspects of this as well. So there's been some investment made on standard development. Uh, the other one was investment made on the staff. So myself and my team uh, have continued on. The other uh, area of investment was on curriculum development. Now, the Treaty 8 has been supported in curriculum development over the last four years to the tune of about a million dollars. For $300,000 a year has been given to Treaty 8 to look at curriculum development. Each of the treaty areas 
have been afforded this, these dollars to do that and have taken a different approach to developing curriculum. Uh, Treaty 8 uh, to date uh, is still working on uh, its form of curriculum development and has been funded uh, by the federal government uh, to do so. And we have a meeting, like I mentioned, uh, on Friday to look at 2016-17 uh, proposal. So that's uh, forthcoming as well. And we're working on those, uh, hoping that we're gonna make more of a larger investment in the Knowledge Center and also some complementary services, obviously. Uh, probably continuing to support some more curriculum development um, and other areas that we can agree on, that Treaty 6, 7, and 8 can agree on that we wanna kinda tackle that kind of complement some of the MOU work and recommendations that you helped uh, help us put together. And, and you're right, uh, I do need to do a newsletter. Uh, I, I will commit to that. I'll get a newsletter out as soon as I can on some of our, uh, our developments. And uh, as far as uh, uh, the presentation, you'll have that available to you uh, today, okay?